Hello, everyone, and welcome to, uh, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Dying with Dignity Canada's um, annual general meeting. We're so pleased to uh, have you here today. Um, excuse me while I get uh, a little bit of our technical things sorted out here. Um, my name is Lena Turkic, and I'm a director on the board of directors for Dying with Dignity. And again, it's my uh, honor to uh, be hosting you today. I have, it has been brought to my attention that I look a little bit like a flight attendant and a little bit of a pylon. So I'm here to guide you through this afternoon. You'll be safe and uh, secure in your lane. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'll have appropriate times for that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also want to uh, humbly acknowledge um, that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Slay, Wetooth, and Musqueam nations. And I want to welcome all of those people who are joining us from all territories. I've been so grateful to have been a learner um, from the diverse Indigenous communities across the country. And uh, I look forward to continuing to learn in that journey and uh, hope you can join me within that. Um, I also want to say thank you so much to uh, the Dying with Dignity staff who have worked so hard to pull uh, today's events together and all that they've done uh, over the year. I know we've all had interactions in different ways and they work so hard. So I just want to say thank you to them. If you can give them a round of applause um, for their amazing work. Thank you. Um, only the main remarks will be live streamed um, and we will end, the, uh, end that before the business portion of the AGM begins. We wanted to bring back the live stream portion because it was so popular last year. Hundreds joined in. We know it's a great way to engage um, our community from coast to coast. So uh, we're so grateful to have you uh, join us online and in person. Virtual is a, is a wonderful way to go and we can't be together in person. There's a number of uh, wonderful speakers who are going to be uh, sharing their thoughts with you today. So I won't uh, hold up the procedure or, uh, or the opening remarks any much further, but I'd like to uh, first introduce Jim Cowan, who is the chair of the Board of Directors of Dying with Dignity Canada, to share a few remarks. Um, we're so grateful for Jim's leadership. He's been a fearless and kind uh, leader in our journey over the last remarkable year, which uh, you'll learn more about. So, Jim, I welcome you to the stage. Thanks very much, Lee, and uh, welcome uh, to all of you uh, this morning, if I just hold that like, just pull it apart. Pull it apart. Oh, I'll look at that. Okay. <laughs> and then I put it like that. Yes. Okay. How's that? Beautiful. Good. Thank you. Well, uh, I, thank you, Lee, and uh, welcome everybody this morning and those who are watching uh, on the live stream. Uh, this is a remarkable organization, and uh, as those of you who are who are here and who are watching know, that's. Uh, that's why you're here and that's why you're watching, because you share in our, in our vision, in, our, uh, in the commitment to this, to this cause. Uh, a lot's happened over the last, uh, over the last year, uh, and uh, you'll hear more about that from, from Shanaz. But I just wanted to share a, just a sort of a, a personal reflection or two if I could, and that is that uh, when I joined the organization uh, after I retired from the Senate a couple of years ago, um, it wasn't clear that the organization uh, had a future, that it was, uh, it was a, in a precarious financial position. Uh, it was, uh, I think many of us hoped that, that the work of the organization would be done because uh, uh, there was legislation in place and uh, our work was done. But as we all know, uh, our work continues. And uh, the organization continues to do very, very important work it has become even more of a leader in this field. It is the go-to organization for those who are interested in uh, end-of-life choices. And uh, that is a, an opportunity. It's a gr tremendous challenge for the organization. And a couple of things have happened in the past year that have made that, uh, made that um, opportunity more realistic or taking advantage of the opportunity more realistic than it was. One is uh, we were fortunate, the fortunate recipient of several large bequests, including uh, a multi-million dollar bequest from Vancouver's Dave Jackson. And that has enabled the organization to look more than just month to month. It enables us to look further into the future and to expand the scope of our operations, to expand our staff, to expand our vision, and to be able to do even better work in the space that, uh, that we are fortunate enough uh, to occupy. And then 
at the end of the year, uh, we were able to uh, regain the charitable status which we'd lost a few years ago. And so now we are, we are um, in a position to issue tax receipts to uh, Canadians who wish to continue to support our organization. So it was a year of transition. It was a year of transformation. Uh, and uh, exciting times are ahead. And again, Shanaz will, uh, will, will, will walk us through some of that, and you can, in the annual report that you will have received, uh, you will see not so much what's happened in the past, but the exciting things that are, that are on the horizon for the future. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the message that I wanted to just briefly bring to you today. Um, it is one of optimism. It's one of enthusiasm. And none of this could have been possible were it not for the commitment of all of you uh, and for the support which you provide on a day-to-day -day basis for the work that, uh, that our organization does. And I wanted, as well, just in closing, to thank my colleagues on the board, uh, but also to thank uh, Shanaz and her, her staff for all they do to make this organization, to make this cause, to advance this cause uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, it is, it's a wonderful organization to be involved in, and uh, the support that you provide uh, throughout the year is, is much, much appreciated and uh, is very valuable to us. Uh, I want now to introduce um, Dr. Jennifer uh, Gibson, uh, who will be speaking to us uh, about some important and interesting issues. Uh, Jennifer is a... Um, has a PhD in philosophy and bioethics and political theory. Her academic work focuses on pragmatic and collaborative approaches to addressing ethical issues in organizational and health system decision making. And she's been a, a key advisor to governments and to public organizations of all types uh, for many years. In 2015, 2016, she co-chaired the uh, federal, provincial, or provincial territorial it wasn't federal, provincial, it was provincial, territorial, expert advisory panel on physician-assisted dying. And I first met her when she was a witness uh, before the uh, Joint Senate uh, House Committee on that topic, um, which led to the uh, introduction of Bill C-14, and then again she testified uh, before the parliamentary hearings uh, on, on that bill. Uh, so. Uh, more, more recently, uh, she chaired the, under the bill, uh, under the act as it was passed, C-14, the government committed to uh, studies on three areas which parliamentarians were not able to deal with in the time available uh, to them when that bill was before the, before the Houses of Parliament. And uh, Jennifer chaired, uh, and the Canadian Council of Academies was commissioned to conduct those studies. And uh, Jennifer chaired uh, the panel, the, the Academy's panel on, on made and advanced requests, which is perhaps the most significant of the three uh, topics which were studied by the, by the Council. And she's going to speak to us today about that experience and her thoughts on uh, the future of, of uh, assisted dying in Canada. So Jennifer, thank you for coming to, to speak to us today and thank you for the good work which you did uh, on, the, on the panel and uh, we look forward to your uh, comments. No, I got the wrong one. It's a pull apart. There. <laughs> Without strangling the off. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim, and um, thank you so much for the invitation to join you. Uh, it's re really an honor to be here with you, um, and it was, I was so delighted uh, when uh, Shanaz asked me if I might be willing to come, and I said, I will make it so, because I think this is going to be such an important opportunity for us to have a conversation about where we're going from here. And I just would like to make a shout out to Dying with Dignity uh, for a couple of reasons. One, of course, I mean, Shanaz and I were talking about this, and Jim would certainly appreciate this as well. Um, after the Carter decision, there were so many moments along
along the way where many of us were called into much more active engagement and what this would actually mean beyond theoretical, beyond sort of ethical arguments, beyond legal arguments into in the daily lives of, of Canadians. And I was sharing today that um, I remember still uh, receiving the ordering council letter from our Ontario government, which was sponsoring the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Group. And it was describing this as, on the one hand, don't get it wrong and don't break confidentiality rules. But the other part of it that was the most compelling part was is this was a call to service. And as an ethicist, I mean, most of what I was, of interest to me is how to translate values into practice. And so this was one of these moments where, I mean, there was a burden of responsibility. Oh my gosh, what if we get it wrong? But also this was one of those moments when I felt incredibly grateful for communities like yours, for my colleagues um, um, who've been working in this area for such a long time and to the Canadians who are saying this is a time we need to keep moving on this. So it's a pleasure to be here. And um, it was a bit of a surprise to realize how small Dying With Dignity was and how stressed it was during the time when it was actually hitting the national stage in such a profound way. So congratulations on, on getting a solid footing under you. The other thing I'd like to acknowledge too about Dying With Dignity is that when, when I started the work in this area in 2015, um, one of the things that became very clear was that for patients, for Canadians, uh, this distinction between made and palliative care is partly an artificial distinction. And so how might we be able to foster a conversation about dying in Canada through this that might acknowledge that for, for many Canadians um, who might not wish to, to um, have a medically assisted death, they nevertheless need good quality end of life care. And so if this conversation about made in Canada could foster a broader and richer conversation about how we all die, how we might wish to die, whatever pathway we might choose to take. Um, I would like to acknowledge that Dying With Dignity has certainly helped to keep that conversation going. And in fact, one of the hopes that I'd had through this process was that perhaps with the introduction of a conversation about MAID, we actually might foster that broader Canadian conversation. We're starting to see that. So really shout out to each of you and the work that you're doing and to the organization who's put really doing this on behalf of all of us. So what I thought I might do is just provide a little bit of grounding in terms of the current status of advanced requests in Canada right now. You will know this already, but I just thought I'd share a few reflections on that. Tell you a little bit more about the Council of Canadian Academies and the work that was done, what it did do, what it didn't do, and where we need to go. Um, and then perhaps open a conversation with you about some future implications based on this moment. And I think this is really a, an, an interesting Canadian story, a, a decades long story. Um, and so we're at a really interesting historical moment right now with the future before us. And so it's important for us to be asking questions of where do we go from here and in what directions might we go. So. Um, just, just a little, I mean, some of you may be very familiar with some of this data already, but this is what, this sort of a snapshot of what MAID looks like in Canada right now. Um, in many ways, it's consistently across, uh, across the country in terms of the federal experience, from the pan-Canadian experience and, and, and province to province, there's a pretty consistent story about who is accessing MAID, who is requesting it, in terms of some of these demographic features. So predominantly, it's individuals who have cancer, um, uh, followed by increasingly neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and then, and then this, this, this sort of other category called other, which I think is starting to put, uh, recognize that we are very rarely at the end of our lives contending with one or a single disease. We have multiple diseases that may be contributing to uh, an experience of suffering, and so this is what is currently being reflected here. Um, the, the average age and the sex ratios um, are, are consistent across the country. Um, and when, one of the interesting shifts that's happened, or even over the last three years, um, is that whereas initially most made provision was um, in a hospital setting, we're starting to see, just as Canadians have been saying, who might, I want to die at home, whatever home might be. Um, I wanted to be dying in the community, surrounded by those I love and those the, the experiences that, that matter most to me, not in an institutional hospital setting. We're starting to see this trend in, in Ontario, a province where I'm from, we saw this t the scale tip about six, six months or so, ago or so, where most people are now receiving made in community settings, um, which is good news if, 
if we see this as part of it, thinking about this as a moment in a trajectory of someone's uh, final days, whatever those that trajectory might look like. The interesting thing is over here, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I actually had meant to put the reference there, um, but there are now some interesting um, uh, prov provincial comparisons that are happening. Right now, in terms of the number of deaths um, as a result of MAVE, we're looking at about 1% of Canadians are, are choosing MAVE, and that's stabilizing it. I think there was an initial phase of um, a, a lot of people accessing it in the early days. So you can see that a little bit in that, see the blue line up there, that's British Columbia in terms of number of, of cases. So you can see an incline there, but things are starting to level level off a little bit. Um, but there are some, but the, there seems to be a clustering of provinces here. We're seeing May being provided across the country. Um, and certainly uh, British Columbia has its own natural history in relation to um, the introduction of, of MAID, which probably explains why it's a, a, there are more MAID cases in, Ontario, in British Columbia than other provinces. But nevertheless, from a pan-Canadian perspective, um, access to MAID is certainly, um, is certainly increasing in terms for, for most Canadians. And we can see this in these, this data. Now, we might ask ourselves, though, uh, so what is the status of advanced requests? And I'll, I'll share one thing. In terms of the, the Provincial Territorial Expert Advisor Group and the Special Joint Committee's work in the lead up to the creation of Bill C-14, advanced requests were considered. I don't think we called them advanced requests. I'm not actually sure where that language came from. Um, but it, we were contemplating a situation where somebody might wish to make a request for a maid um, that would be administered at a point when they might not may no longer have capacity to actually consent to it. And the ex provincial Territorial Expert Advisory Group um, indicated that yes, that there ought to be some form of advance request. This was also confirmed by the Special Joint Committee, and yet um, Bill C-14 um, was where, where, with the law that we currently have, um, it, it developed a law that made this um, you know, made us ineligible for an advance request for made. So I thought it might be useful to parse out, to parse this out a little bit. So where does it actually explicitly say that you cannot make an advance request for made? It doesn't say that you cannot. What it does say is what you must do. And so um, made right now, as you're very well aware, you must be able to, a competent person must be able to make a request for made, but they also, prior to its administration, must be able to make express consent. So if there were, if, if advance requests were introduced into Canada, we would see that final express consent uh, removed from that legislation. So currently it's not legally permissible uh, precisely because of that important, uh, that important procedural step of providing final consent right before administration of MAID. So we might ask, well, but, but let's be clear. Um, there is a risk of capacity loss. Um, we, we look at the demographics in Canada right now. We do know that we are seeing, as in other countries around the globe, increasing incidence of dementia. We do know that certain medications can lead to compromise in, in, in terms of a person's capacity. So we might ask ourselves, well, we know that that's the case already. Is the law silent on capacity loss? And it's actually not silent on capacity loss because there is a provision within the what are called the procedural safeguards that allows for, um, well, requires first of all that after somebody makes a re uh, an eligible requ valid request, that 10 reflection days or 10, uh, 10 clear days um, or uh, have to be completed before MAID can be administered, except there is a provision that allows for two clinicians to be able to assess in the case that somebody might be at the risk of imminent loss of capacity or imminent death to shorten that 10-day waiting period. So in fact, the law is not entirely silent about the possibility of loss capacity, but it, it is really anchored to this 10-day waiting period that means that somebody who might be at risk of loss of, of capacity might actually end up receiving MAID soon sooner than they might have according to the requirement of the law. So at day eight, for example, as the case might be. But another question that sometimes arises is, um, are persons with dementia or other, given the anchor that our law has in, in terms of capacity is sort of a, is an important um, safeguard within our legislation right now, is what about persons with dementia or other capacity limiting conditions, are they excluded from access to MAID currently? 
And the answer to that is no, not necessarily, because although one might have a diagnosis of dementia or of a capacity limiting, potentially capacity limiting condition, you might be still capable of making your own treatment decisions. So it's not necessarily the case that by virtue of having that diagnosis that you are ineligible for MAID. Um, because what we've anchored our legislation to is that you must be capable of making decisions related to your health, and many people with dementia are very, more than capable of, or are capable of doing so for a great duration of, of time. So one could have, be uh, requesting MAID um, whilst also concurrently, for one condition, whilst also concurrently having dementia. Now, the reason why I'm flagging this is that a lot of the discourse and the discussion around advanced requests um, has been, have been embedded in reflections and worries about how we care for, how we respond to uh, persons with dementia in our society. Um, and so worries about stigma, worries about the extent to which persons with dementia may be more vulnerable if we were to see a much more permissive law than we currently have at this time. So this was some of the legal context that was the starting point for our reflections of the Council of Canadian Academies. We knew what the law permitted, what it didn't permit, and being very clear on that was an important step for us. Now, I'd like to introduce two hypothetical, but I think uh, recognizable um, case scenarios for you. The first is, I'd like to introduce you to Mo. And now Mo um, is, um, it was a vignette, we, we described Mo in the Council of Canadian Academies report. Mo was, was um, had uh, a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. He, he'd also had a few strokes over the past year, was worried about the possibility that he might end up with a with a stroke in the future. He was found eligible for MAID. His wife was supportive of his, uh, his, his desire to have MAID. Um, and there was his concern and his anxiety was, well, wow, I've been found eligible, but what if I have a stroke during those 10 day waiting, that 10 day waiting period and I'm no longer able to exercise my wish to have MAID? So what are the options available to him? Well, in our current legislation, the option would be either one, you take your chances, and you just hope for the best, that you actually get to the end of your 10 days and are able to consent, or it would mean that he would have to have made sooner than he might necessarily have wished to. So in that particular case, it's a situation where somebody is eligible, they have been found eligible, it's this 10-day waiting period, and now they find themselves in a position where they're worried that they might lose capacity. The law addresses that, but it's not necessarily what Mo and his wife and his, their family may have wished to have. Now let's look at Vi. Now Vi um, has for, for many, many years been an advocate of medical assistance in dying. She is, she's expressed to her family in a number of different ways that she would like to have made at some point in the future. Um, and she has a diagnosis of dementia. And at the time that she'd made this, these, her, her wish is known, she had shared this with her clinician, her clinician knew, her family knew, um, and as her dementia increased, um, and then she now finds herself in a long-term care facility, and her children, who were aware of the fact that she uh, would like to have, have made under certain conditions, which she said, if I'm no longer able to recognize you, for example, my children, if I'm no longer enjoying life, um, they then are faced with the decision to clarify, is the, are these the circumstances that mom Vi would want to have made administered? She has good days, she has bad days. She seems to recognize us some days, she doesn't recognize us the other days. So a little bit unclear, notwithstanding what her earlier wishes were, a little more unclear about, hmm, under what circumstances recognizing that it's her children in this case who would be needing to make the decision about when to have the maid administered. Is this the right time? So both seem to be the types of scenarios that we might be able to imagine could come up for a Canadian today. Um, one is much more familiar to us, per perhaps a little bit more like um, what we might know from, the, from stories hearing about Audrey Parker, very clear, she knew what the proximal risk was, had been found eligible. Um, my father has dementia, and so when I watch his day to day, um, I, he never would have wanted made, but if he, if he had, I can understand how there might be some unclarity um, for a clinical team, but also for uh, my mom, who, would, who has power of attorney, to decide, ah, is this the moment? So what do we do about that? 
So um, these were some of the questions that we, we, we knew we had going into these independent reviews. And in the Bill C-14, um, within 18 day, 180 days of royal assent, the Minister of Justice and the Minister of Health were required to initiate a set of independent studies. Now, independent studies looking at requests for mature minors, because mature minors would be excluded as a result of the age limit of 18 years or older. A request for mental illness is the sole underlying medical condition and advanced requests. So the Council of Canadian Academies, which I'm not sure if you've heard of them, I didn't know a whole lot about them um, until I began to work with them. The Council of Canadian Academies is a council of three different types of academies, one which is the Council of Academic Health Sciences, one of Social Sciences, or the um, Royal Society of Canada, and the third which is looking at the natural and the in, in, in engineering sciences. It's a council that is a science organization. They look, they review the evidence, they provide um, a synthesis of that evidence, they provide an assessment of that evidence to inform policy making. Um, and so the Minister, the Minister of Health and, and Justice had, had contacted the Council of Canadian Academies and said, we need a body, we need someone to do these independent reviews, would you be willing to do so? And the Council of Canadian Academies agreed. Now, what we were asked to do, and this was a, this was a, um, um, the, the mandate letter, if you will, um, asks that we look at uh, gathering relevant information from a diverse range of perspectives, recognizing that these were, um, these were perspectives that would tap into um, different views of the world and different types of evidence, but to look at these on all three topics to, in order to inform dialogue. I'll get to back to that in just a second, and that these reports would need to be completed in such time so that the reports could be tabled in Parliament as they were in December uh, this past year. So, uh, actually, what were we, so that was what we were asked to do, to have a look at the available evidence, to gather that, to synthesize it, and to assess it and report what we had learned. What we were not asked to do was to do public consultations. Um, this was, uh, as we understood, if it was to inform dialogue, this is the role of government, to consult with the public. It was something that was not considered part of our mandate at this time, and it's not actually not part of what the Council of Canadian Academies would normally do. Uh, we were not to make recommendations or to advocate policy decisions, um, which made it distinct from the other panel, which is a provincial territorial expert advisory panel, where we have been specifically mandated to provide recommendations for what made ought to look like in Canada. Um, we were not to evaluate the current law, so we were not meant to provide comment on whether or not the law was per too permissive or not permissive enough, and we were not to take positions on any current legal challenges. And as you know, during this time, the um, justice, um, was actually in the midst of, of some legal proceedings related to other cases. Now, you might look at this and you can say, wow, our hands were tied. We couldn't say what we really thought. And I'm going to suggest to you that, in fact, this actually freed us up in a lot of ways. Um, because it, if I look at the composition of the room and the working group that I was a part of, uh, there were individuals in that working group who favored medical assistance in dying and some who had some pretty significant worries about it. And so what this allowed us to do was to canvas a range of different perspectives and look at the evidence with a little bit of critical distance without having to take a position. Now, uh, granted, I mean, what might have been most helpful for the development of policy were a set of recommendations, but at the same time, this is part of the work of Dying with Dignity and of and parliamentarians, in fact, is to take this further. But we can have more conversation about that afterward. But as the chair of this working group, it was a bit of a relief to be able to not find ourselves trying to crowd people into reaching recommendations that around which there was enough uh, moral controversy at this particular time. So what did we do? So over about an 18 month process, we met, met six times. Uh, we had a panel of about 43 people across all three groups. My panel had 10 people on it, um, including folks um, internationally, uh, who, and international experts. On ours, we had somebody who was an international uh, Scottish legal scholar um, in this very topic area, as well as folks from the Netherlands. It was terrific to have that diversity perspectives. Went through a process of iterative review publication, of course, it had to be translated. So everything that we've reflected in these reports was what we knew to date as of August 2018. So it's a green document. We are still learning in our system. So that's one of the limitations of such documents is always that they always need to be refreshed and renewed. And so there's, a, there's still work to be done. 
we looked at a range of different things. We looked at uh, published evidence, we looked at international sources, we looked at regulation and reasoning around regulation and uh, the law. We looked at policy documents. We also reached out to 500 organizations, although we didn't do public consultation. We reached out to 500 organizations across the country with a stake in these topics to say, what's the evidence that you might have? What's the insight that you might have that we might not otherwise find if not for you telling us what we should be thinking about. Uh, 59 organizations responded and uh, submitted their, their reflections in. Dying with Dignity provided a lot of um, stories from, the, from their members, sharing from a lived experience what, some of the reasons why they thought these were important topics in what respects. Um, and also recognizing, too, uh, there were um, one of the things that we'd noticed along the way, we had a, a, a number of our panel members who are Indigenous health scholars and clinicians um, said, you know what, we need to be engaging a conversation with our, our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. And so uh, with, their, with their help, we brought together an elder circle to say, again, what is it we're missing? What are we not seeing that we need to be seeing in the, in the work that we do? So in terms of the advanced request working group, just share a couple of our findings. Our focus was to look, at, of course, at what's the available evidence that will help inform our understanding about advanced requests. Okay, so one of the things we needed to recognize that we have to, we're not operating in a vacuum. What's the Canadian context that, that's putting this topic on the table today? Um, or at, and still, I mean, at that time and, and still today, and one of the things that was clear, we've got changing societal norms about this. We do know that certainly um, support for medical assistance in dying in general has been high for quite some time, but is much higher now. Uh, we also know that uh, we're, we're hearing consistent interest um, for um, advanced requests. We're seeing that coming out of some public uh, public surveys. We know that more people are experiencing capacity limiting conditions, so we needed to be thinking about what the implications of MAID would be in, in a demographic context such as this. And we also knew that um, there are a number of reasons why somebody might seek an advanced request for MAID. One would be certainly to avoid future suffering. The other would be to be able to, to be able to have control over the manner of their death, even if they are unable to make that final consent themselves. So, you know, we were aware of that context, and this was, it was a Canadian story of this particular moment in time that was putting this on the agenda for us to consider. One of the things we did not have was an actual definition of an advance request, but quite simply, it was, it was again, this idea that some, you or I might wish to make, um, make a request for MAID um, that would allow us to be able to have MAID provided if, in, in, the, in case, or in the event that we were, you were to lose capacity to make that final consent. So in order to be under, unpack this, though, we looked at three different scenarios. The case where somebody has not yet had a diagnosis, that might be, lead to a grievous and serious ir or a grievous and irremediable medical condition. Somebody who may have a serious diagnosis but not yet been found to be eligible for MAID. And then finally, like Mo, um, somebody who may have been found eligible for MAID but be worried about losing capacity in that context. So if we were to map Mo and Vi on here, Mo would be in, the, in category one after eligibility and Vi would likely be in category two after diagnosis but before being found eligible. Now, um, these, this way of thinking about this helped to unravel a few things for us. Um, I think some, there was often quite a bit of anxiety about dementia and advanced requests because of people's anxieties about dementia. We needed to be able to unpeel back those, the veil of dementia in a sense, better understand the, uh, the trajectory of those, that, that disease, but also to not make this all about dementia, that there might be numerous reasons why somebody might be making a request for advance for, for MAID that had very little to do with dementia. Dementia might be the complicating factor, not the reason why somebody might be seeking it. So there were three types of uncertainty that started to surface through our reflections um, that, that tell the story about how we might want to bring some nuance thinking about this, that not every case is the same. So the status of the patient. So what are the clinical circumstances of the, of the patient? Where is the, the individual on their trajectory right now? Um, and so that, that's a, that is a difference between Mo and Vi, for example. Um, how much clarity was there about the individual's wishes? 
Um, to whom did they to articulate these? How consistent were they? How persistent were they? How, how detailed were they to provide guidance? And the third was, given that at some point if advance requests were to be made available, somebody needs to, need to make, that, make the call about when. And so it really speaks to those third parties who would need to be involved in that process. So what is their stre the strength of those relationships, but also of their understanding of the patient in terms of those specific requests? And so what became clear is that, that some of those in any one patient or any one individual's uh, life journey, any number of these factors may become more or less relevant. And so you could imagine the uncertainty as over a continuum over time. And of course, the closer, uh, in the case of Mo, for example, much less uncertainty. He's been very clear, family is supportive, and it's, it's the idiosyncrasy of a 10-day waiting period that seems to create the problem in his case. Whereas for Vi, Hmm, it was, she was probably a lot clearer at some points and maybe less so as time goes on and, and also the, the concern about whether or not these circumstances were precisely the ones that she had in mind. Did she have those things in mind? And so some of that uncertainty is one thing that we realized we needed to uh, make much clearer. So we thought, well, okay, so what can we learn then from the Canadian context that gives us some insight about how we navigate this? And of course, a natural, naturally, our, our heads went to, well, advanced requests, advanced care planning, advanced directives, similar sorts of things. So we wanted to look at what uh, was going on. And one of the things that we noted right off the bat is advanced directives isn't even terminology in all provinces. Proxy directives, the language we use in Alberta and, and Ontario, we don't have legislation related to advanced directives. There's proxy directives. So, I mean, there's proxies, but, but it's also not even necessarily a directive. I mean, it's, this is where there's a patchwork in terms of approaches, but the concept seemed to be one that there, we have a good understanding of people wanting to ensure that their wishes are executed for them um, in the case where they're not able to express their own wishes in the future. Um, the research that was available, the evidence we have available um, around the effectiveness of advanced directives is uh, pretty patchy right now, and it's limited, but what it's showing is that there is increasing use of these, partly I think precipitated by um, sort of change in the demographic and a sort of a, a, the more we talk about death, the more people want to be able to shape their own deaths in significant ways. So we're seeing some increase in the use of advanced directives. And what evidence there is available, um, it's, we find that it tends to be positive to having neutral effect on, on um, treatment decisions. I think the more difficult thing is often for clinicians um, to be able to A, know that there was an advanced directive and B, families to have been aware what's in the What's what's in there? So that it's 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 um it's, there's some work to be done in terms of educating both of those folks. So again, advanced directives seem to say something, but it didn't give us a, a, a whole lot to work with. Um, so we thought, well, what's going on, and what can we learn from the experience of Mage? such as we have. We, at this point, we'd had about two years' experience with it. What did that tell us? There was some research that had been shown, and one of the worries that sometimes has been raised about MAID is that someone might change their mind. So if somebody were to, if we were to allow an advance request to be um, honored, we were to honor that, what if they had changed their minds during that, into that period of time? So one by proxy um, indicator would be just to try to find out whether or not people's preferences are stable over time. And there have been a few st Canadian studies that have shown that uh, once somebody has, has indicated an interest in MAID, they tend to hold to that interest. And we see some of the Canadian data showing that very often it's not so much people changing their minds it's that, that explains why they don't receive MAID. It's because either they lost capacity or they died prior to having uh, MAID provided. So, you know, there's a great deal of preference stability there that, or signals that there would be. And the other was there were some studies that were being conducted in Quebec by Gina Bravo um, that was focusing in particular on the intersection between advanced requests and dementia um, and that was starting to show that in fact there were, it, that the scenario, it mattered, that in fact that caregivers and clinical staff were much more comfortable with the idea of, of honoring an advanced request in the case of, of dementia if the person was towards the end of their lives in a much more advanced stage of the disease than in the middle period. But again, these were opportunities that we still need to better understand this phenomenon. But, you know, if anything, the, some of what the benefit of the report was is we showed where the gaps were in our understanding that we need to be filling. So then, if, if not in Canada, what can we learn from international jurisdictions? So uh, Benelux countries, so Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands, 
all have um, what they call advanced euthanasia directives they have for some time. So what might we learn from them in terms of how they've approached these? Uh, Be Belgium and Luxembourg um, do permit um, advanced euthanasia directives, but only in the case where an individual is irreversibly con unconscious. If they're unconscious, they're no longer suffering, therefore there's, there's the, the idea that if it, they're at that particular state, then, it's, then it would be acceptable and appropriate to honor that advanced euthanasia directive. Not too much data on this, unfortunately. We know that this is the case, but we're, not, we, we're unable to track the data. And that has a lot to do with the data monitoring in those countries compared to the Netherlands, which is data rich, story rich. They are really monitoring what, it, what is happening. But their conception of an advanced euthanasia directive is entirely different. It is anchored to suffering. You, if you are to be, um, if you, you need to be conscious to some extent in order to suffer. So there, that's a big difference between Belgium and Luxembourg and the Netherlands. And so um, we were able to, um, to look at some of the cases uh, other than the Netherlands, which had to be translated from Dutch into, into English for us to have a look at. Um, although they actually don't track um, the, the individuals necessarily, it, it, we're unable to get access to all those who had advanced euthanasia directives. There are large numbers of those who are. But we wanted to see of those, who, those individuals who received um, euthanasia and had dementia, um, it, what could we learn from those particular cases? There were 16 such cases at that time. And 12 of them were, were uncontroversial. There was, the clinicians were confident, the families were confident that, the, that these were the circumstances under which the individual would want an advanced, uh, you, would want euthanasia. But there were four cases that um, raised questions about whether or not they were consistent with uh, the Dutch due care criteria. Now here's an interesting problem about evidence. So if you look at this, you could look at this and say, wow, Four, oh, actually, that's, I said four out of 12. That should be four out of 16. 25% case of these cases were controversial. Is that too high or is that too low? So, you know, and it depends on what your, where, what your orientation is. You can say, wow, 12 out of 16, 75% are uncontroversial that in, they actually met the due care criteria. There is a contested nature about some of this evidence precise that may reflect where you sit on the topic in the first place. So it became very clear, at least to me as a chair, um, that in fact we needed to tell a Canadian story here. We needed to have the conversation about whether or not is that too few, is that too many controversial cases, or is that just useful? Is that just insightful, or is this something we should be worried about? This is a Canadian story also because the history, the natural history of the introduction of, it, of euthanasia into these countries is quite different than our own, and yet there's a lot we share in common. So the Canadian story is one we need to continue to be putting our efforts into to tell, although these might shed some light of where we may, may want to fo focus our attention. So we were asked to consider what are potential impacts. I think many would agree that, in fact, um, advanced requests would certainly foster um, support for a person's autonomy, their ability to, each of our ability to have control over what happens to us at the end of our lives and be able to be the authors of what that might be in a way that um, would serve to alleviate not only our own suffering, but what we're also hearing from many families too is that being able to see that their loved ones die peacefully in, in these ways is actually alleviating some of their own suffering, uh, suffering of families. Uh, just simply knowing that an advanced request is a possibility might in itself alleviate some of the suffering um, associated with um, anxieties associated with loss of capacity. Um, it's acknowledged, we need to acknowledge though that this does add an additional decision-making burden on family members who would need to decide at which point the advance request ought to be honored. There were some worries that were also raised by some, um, some of the, the, the stakeholder input that we received just about how, particularly in relation to persons with capacity loss, person with, with dementia, how a liberalization or an expansion of the, of the legislation might serve to reinforce stigma associated with dementia. It's an empirical question, but it's because we don't know. Um, but at the same time, this were some of the anxieties associated with this. And then finally, um, again, as this is not unique to advance requests, but just general concerns of people might be opting for and made 
or an advance request were made as a result of insufficient access to additional resources. Again, an empirical question, which I don't think we're, I mean, I've, I've spent some time uh, meeting with colleagues and presenting at, at conferences in the US, and their resource context tells a dramatically different story where people are actually bankrupting, finding themselves bankrupting themselves in terms of accessing treatment, um, and really making that hard choice between sustainability of my family and, the, and, and whether or not I actually um, have assisted assisted death. And that's not something we're seeing here. But I think keeping our eye on what, are, what about, you know, are, if we're really ensuring that all Canadians have access to a good death in one way or another, we need to be attentive to this broader environment. So we did identify and report a number of, if it were to be introduced, some safeguards, some of them you would not be surprised by. But I just want to highlight here some of the system level work that we're already doing um, as, a, as broadly as a system related to advanced care planning. Knowing each other's wishes is going to be so critical for any form of quality of end-of-life care, but particularly if, if, if advance requests were introduced. But continued efforts related to palliative care as well, um, just it, it's good in itself to be able to provide that. And we know out of um, some of the recent findings out of Quebec is that most people accessing MAID, and we see this in other jurisdictions as well, are already also receiving palliative care. So it's not an either-or. It's really, again, about the quality of the dying experience. And then some additional work that that needs to be done in terms of oversight and um, and learning more from what we are, what our experience is. So in, in terms of future implications, this is where I thought we might just sort of open it up um, and see what you think might be possible. But I thought I might just share some initial thoughts on this. I think we're in a really interesting time right now. One of the things that I didn't mention was at this 180 day mark where the independent reviews ought to have been conducted, the other milestone that's coming up, and Jim, what would be five years out would be so it's five years out of, uh, after royal assent, the legislation will be reviewed again. Now, is that in the fifth year or after the, in the fifth year. so it would be 2021. 20, so it would start in 2020. So in about, yeah. So we've got, so we're looking forward just in terms of the requirements of the legislative process. There is a five-year review of the current legislation uh, that might see some either revisions could go any dip, any direction, um, but then of course that it does, that's a, it, that's not dependent on which government it is. So there's this interesting dynamic which is called the election, which is cir circling. Which um, you know, I, I think my sense is that, and, and it's almost like you know, it's almost like you could sit around a table and you could you could raise you could bet, and then circumstances change and it keeps changing as well. Um, you know, I think there would have been more of an appetite with the Liberal government to actually see some potential amendments to the legislation, uh, particularly related to advanced requests. I'm not sure that mature minors and uh, persons with uh, sole underlying conditions have. have um, being mental disorder, I'm not sure that we'd necessarily see movement there. But if a conservative government or a minority government comes in, you just kind of wonder what the appetite's going to be. So it, my sense is, and I'd be love to get your thoughts on this, if there is going to be any advance requests that introduced at all, it would likely have to be through legal means. Um, court cases, this sort of thing that sort of nudge that nudge that along. So it's um, it's an interesting it's an interesting moment in time that it's still unfolding. So I, I welcome your thoughts and reflections back on how you're seeing things right now and what we also need to continue to keep on our minds as we continue down this journey together. So I'll leave it there. Let me, let me, on behalf of everyone here and everybody who was watching, uh, thank Jennifer uh, for her excellent presentation today, but also for the, for the body of work that she and her colleagues did on those three topics. Uh, I know that uh, when I first heard that uh, the government uh, was, was saying no recommendations, I was, I was disappointed about that. I thought, well, this is a wasted opportunity. But I, I, in, in hindsight, and I did tell Jennifer this when we met a, a month or so ago at the uh, when she came to the Dying with Dignity offices, that I think in hindsight uh, I was wrong and they were right. I think this, and as she's explained uh, today, this gave them an opportunity to address uh, issues which might not have otherwise been addressed because they were just too hard to do so. Yeah. And the result is this, that we now have, and uh, there was a, a screenshot there a, a moment ago of the three volumes of that were produced by the by the, by the council, and what that does is give those of us who are interested in these topics 
a body of evidence that we can look at. And so if we want to have a discussion on any of these topics, a good starting point is to read that document. And then at least we're engaging in a discussion based upon evidence and not myth and, 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 and fiction and, and prejudice and all that sort of thing. So I think that, that Jennifer and her colleagues have done us all and done this, this subject matter, this public policy subject matter, a great deal of good because we now have evidence upon which to base discussions. And we've had discussions uh, between DWDC and the Council about how we can advance this discussion, part of our, the education mandate of, of Dying with Dignity Canada, to make sure that all of this good work just isn't another report that's put on a shelf somewhere. So uh, on, I, I, personally, I want to, to thank uh, uh, her for her work and for her commitment, continuing commitment, as you can tell, passion for this, for this cause. It is not easy. These are not, these are not easy questions, but I think that the work that uh, she and her colleagues have done has enabled Canadians to engage in a debate on this topic in a much more informed way, and it will lead to better solutions, uh, whether they come uh, from the courts or they come from, from the legislators. Uh, we'll be better off as a result. So thank you for, Thanks, your, uh, for your work. Thank you for what you've done here today. And uh, uh, Lee is going to moderate uh, the questions which you kindly agreed to take. Great, thank sure. you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that's, uh, that's amazing. Thank you, Jennifer. And um, I do believe that we have a limited amount of time for questions. Yeah. Um, you've, yeah. she's, she's very busy. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot to cover. So um, we will take uh, questions. We have um, a microphone that can be passed around to um, any members in the group who uh, might want to ask. Yes. The yes. question is, where is the report available to the public? So it's available on the Council of Canadian Academies website. And in fact, Shanaz, I'm just wondering if I think you've got access to it. So um, is maybe that could be something that could just be made available to the members. It is publicly available. And um, actually, I used to have a slide that gave you the information. And I took it out because I didn't want too many slides. So I'm, it's not hidden. It's just and we just need to get that information to you. And it's, for, it's available in an electronic form, or you can contact the Canadian Council of Academies, Council of Canadian Academies, and they'll send you a hard copy. So it could be either, if one's preferable. Great. Yes, go is, ahead. My microphone is on. Hi, my name is Connie Jorsvik, and I've been helping work on the Advanced Care Planning British Columbia Toolkit. And I teach Advanced Care Planning in the general public probably three or four sessions a month um, at all different kinds of venues. When I started, the, started teaching a few years ago, medical assistance in dying was number one, reaching, um, met, I met with some resistance. That resistance has just completely fallen off, so I just wanted to give that when I'm teaching advanced care planning and I get to medical assistance in dying and then I talk about advanced requests, all of a sudden the interest goes through the roof. And people are at the front of their chairs. Most of the people who attend are women who are in their 70s and 80s. And they very, very, very much want advanced requests. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be not so much for themselves, but for to reduce the amount of burden and stress for their families. Mm. Um, I'm even in, in that, that place. And there are a lot of studies that are showing that we're going to have a 43% increase in 75-year-olds in the next 11 years, and that we don't have the infrastructure for, to be able to care for. And I think that the, what I'm bringing up is your point of that we don't have the problem yet of the United States with the financial burden, but I think that that's coming, and I'm seeing it more and more, where the governments are saying to families, well, you could add to your mom or dad's care with private care mm -hmm. and private um, residential care, which is going to massively increase the burdens on families. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make that, that point that I think that we're going to see what's happening in the U.S. 
Thanks so much for that reflection. Um, because I, and this is where um, we have the advantage at this moment, anticipating that that might be a pressure to figure out what we're going to do about it. Because if, in fact, we want to see within Canada uh, a continuing commitment to each one of us dying in the manner that is appropriate based on our own wishes and um, medical assistance and dying certainly fosters that, we need to ensure that we have systems in place that still allows people to make that choice. So the more that we, and this is, it's not by, it, it's not by chance that we start to see, um, and I think one of the unintended but unexpected consequences of the introduction of medical assistance in dying in Canada is a conversation that is putting attention to resources in ways that I think we haven't seen so much. Um, and we're seeing conversations redoubled and becoming stronger about uh, dementia, care, dementia care strategies um, that is going to be seeking equity across the country or palliative care strategies that require a societal effort to do so. So what I'm hoping is that we don't inadvertently find ourselves treating um, certain types of dying as a way of solving the resource problem. If we're a caring society, we need to be thinking about this comprehensively. So I always see, uh, as we talk about medical assistance in dying, um, is this is part of that broader conversation about how we ought to die, how we will die. And I'm always so grateful when I see people reaching across the table. Like you're talking about how people's perceptions are, have changed. Um, it is so encouraging now to see um, uh, palliative care providers or social care providers saying, I'm not sure how I feel about MAID, but I sure care about these people. So how can we better, and it's that reaching across the table work that I think we need to be facilitating and fostering, but really encouraging our provincial governments and territorial governments to keep moving those, the attention and the policy resources and policy tools into the communities where people are actually living. And it, it, but that's a that's a policy choice. But that's where groups like yours, groups like uh, academics, also can have a really important role to play. To keep reinforcing, beating that drum, that it's um, compassionate society is both. It's not just. You know, anyway, I'll just stop there because I think we're agreeing. <laughs> and any other questions for Jennifer? Yes, um, at the back. Derek. Yeah, uh, Derek Smith. You've talked about advanced requests and advanced directives. It seems to me that they're pretty much part of the same package. So why is it that we allow people to have decisions like no antibiotics, no tube feeding, no, yeah. none of that, but we don't allow them access to assisted dying? Such a great question, because conceptually they seem so similar, right? And we see, we see the use of advanced directives in other types of decisions that might lead to someone's death, right? Um, there are a couple of differences that I think we just uh, we need to get our heads need to get our heads around. Um, one is that most um, most decisions, treatment decisions that might lead to someone's death, say withdrawal of care or stop uh, or uh, not starting care, or we know that the likely outcome will be that person's death, is governed under professional regulation and under consent laws and and so on. So sort of really on the ground, and it's part of day to day clinical practice. Um, medical assistance in dying has the weight of the criminal code on, on it. And so um, it starts to, for, certainly for clinicians, some clinicians, they, they feel that burden that, oh gosh, if I get this wrong, I mean, the burden on me is, is quite different. So we may want to think through um, how, at least in the short term, how an advance request which would fall underneath a the criminal code, or need to be compliant with whatever the provincial, the, the federal legislation is around medical assistance in dying, what that might actually mean in practice. So I think there's a little bit of a legal dimension to, to that. Um, the other thing is as well, I think uh, advanced directives in general are not necessarily specific to the case where somebody might be making a decision that could potentially lead to their death. I mean, advanced directives could be in the case of, in the case of a surgery, what are you consenting to so that we don't need to wake you up again and find out what your wishes are. So it, it can cover a whole range of different type of treatment decisions. And so um, we, often, uh, we often link these two advanced directives and, and treatment decisions that might lead to someone's death, but not necessarily. So I, there is, I think, um, some, again, some practice-related or policy-related questions we may want to ask ourselves about how, what this would actually look like in practice um, in 
at, in these particular cases as opposed to others. So it's not that they're, so I'm kind of, I'm with you. I mean, conceptually, they're related. I think the, what we, we, we need to think through is the le legality and also the clinically, are they going to be practiced in the same way? And in the future, they might actually in, indeed be. But right now, I think we're still unraveling some of these pieces. Okay, my name is Bill Fernow. Um, we, we already actually have a process that my mother went through 15 years ago where she had made one of these advance requests and when the day came that she was in the condition she predicted, uh, water and food were withdrawn. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who went through it just about a month ago mm -hmm. and uh, water and food were withdrawn. Now, in my mother's case, it was a 30-day exercise, in my friend's case, an older man, it was 10 days. We've got these going on, but what we're talking about here is making it immediate, within a few minutes rather than days. And I don't see the difference, I'm sorry, but I, I think we're missing a tie here. Thank you. Yeah, I, that, it's so interesting because um, there's, suff there's so much suffering in, in those, uh, what you're describing, right? And if this, if, if, our, if medical assistance in dying has as its object to alleviate suffering, then why are we treating it differently than other forms of ways in which we alleviate suffering? On the other hand, uh, this is uh, an amendment to a criminal code. Its journey into our clinical experience and our patient experience is so different. So, you know, and philosophically, there are, there's disagreement around this. I will tend to agree with you that there isn't that much of a difference here between these types of decisions, but it is contested. So this is where the hard policy work that has to happen, which um, I don't think we're gonna please everybody from a policy perspective, but these are the types of conversations that Jim was talking about too. We need to better understand that because I think very often people are more afraid of made because it seems more active. It seems like we're ending a life and yet it, so many decisions in that journey of somebody at the end of their lives um, might also precipitate that. So, yeah, you, you and I might be having a conversation at dinner agreeing with each other, but we know that next door to us at, at the table there may be others who may not, and, but that's where we are right now. Yeah, and I don't think we'll resolve it. It's been going on for centuries. So we just have time for one more question. Um, Jonathan, unsurprisingly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, my name's Jonathan Regler. I'm a physician and maid provider, um, and I'm on the board. And I'm also on the board of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and oh, Providers great. and the chair of its Standards and Guidelines Committee. Context. Um, great. There, 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 there are really within, I mean, there's a spectrum, but there are two ends of the spectrum. And one says that patients ought to be able to basically write their own advance re in request. When I can't recognize my daughter, I can't do the Globe and Mail crossword, end my life. Yeah. And then there's the other end which says that it should be solely suffering based mm -hmm. and that that should be as far as possible objectively assessed by a physician. Mm -hmm. I would say most, not all, providers are in the second camp because we want to avoid the Dutch experience of the happily demented person seeing somebody coming at them with a needle. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that the council's working group couldn't make, shouldn't, didn't make recommendations and I understand why now. Um, I wonder whether you as an ethicist and speaking solely in your sort of professorial um, position might give us some idea of where you see the tensions lying and finally landing. Hmm. That's a great question. Because I think that you, you note something that it, it wasn't as immediately obvious to me as it is now, is that the, our understanding of suffering within our current legislation is a really subjective understanding of suffering. Suffering is, I am experiencing it. Um, and, and yet we've got um, efforts within in, in the Netherlands to try to, uh, it's much more objective, but it's also trying to provide guidance to a clinician. Here's suffering when you see it. So I mean, that's just the phenomenon of suffering, having, having to figure that out. So regardless of what our law says, you, somebody's gonna still have to interpret what they're seeing as yes, this is suffering, and suffering as that individual believed to be suffering. Um, I think we, we could, I mean, I, I would love to be able to see us um, a, acknowledge that. It's going to be tough. So what would make make this 
better and easier for all of us. I think there's still a lot of work for each of us as individuals to articulate what suffering would mean for us at all. And some certain amount of insight is needed. So I look at my father, for example. I was, I was saying this to Shanaz this morning. Um, he's aware that he has dementia. Some days he's aware of it more than other days. But he does this, oh, my dumb brain, you know? And there is a, uh, so he has insight now into his disease um, that he would not have had six years ago at the beginning. So he has that insight. And I think very often uh, people who we, in some ways, uh, we have a perception of what our suffering might be until we get in there and we realize, ah, this is suffering and this is tolerable and this is not tolerable. So it becomes really difficult, I think, for each of us, probably just in, in, in general, to be able to articulate, these are the circumstances under which I would like my, my life to end. Um, because it may not be quite what you expect. That's the uncertainty that often is flagged as a concern. But one might also say, well, it, you're taking the risk as an individual. Um, and if you're willing to trust your, your family member, your proxy, your substitute decision maker to, to make the call about this is the right time, then you are trusting in them. Your trust is in them, not so much in the phenomenon of suffering. So, you know, I think for each of us, we might look at this a little differently. One of our um, panel members, um, geriatric psychiatrist, said, you know what, I don't need to spell it out. My, my spouse knows in detail what, what I would want. I trust him. He'll know. He knows me well enough to know when. Um, but that's the nature of their relationship, that there would be that clarity. And she, it's not so much about the, nat the particulars of that phenomenon of, of suffering, whether or not objectively or not, it's there. It's trusting his judgment to, to make that call. I, so this was not, this is, I think, more of a mapping of the train of sort of the variability, but also some of the issues. But I can see how this becomes a challenge if you're going to start to provide guidelines. So, so okay, you know, doc or nurse practitioner, here's how you figure it out. It's, yeah, and, and I think we're going to need to, uh, we're going to need to work that out. But it, however, I mean, oh gosh, I'd love to talk to you about it. But okay, I was going to ask you a question back, which I can't. But maybe later. Well, if you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We, we can convene no, okay, 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 okay. For sure. Okay, but is that? Yeah, I, maybe I'll just leave it. I mean, that was very unhelpful and very unuseful, <laughs> and I apologize. But it was a great question, and that got me thinking, and it got me thinking: about How can we do? How can we get this untangled? So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and. Beyond that, how the regulatory bodies looking at that law figure out what guidance they, they ought to provide. I mean, it's, but you know what? We did it the first time. We, we're, I mean, this was one of the worries that happened with the introduction of Bill C-14 is how the interpretability of that law in terms of clinical practice. And we're getting closer, partly by the work of KMAP, um, by the work of various colleges saying, here's what we mean about this from the lived experience of, of, of patients and their families saying this was what this meant for me. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if we see something similar having to, with an amendment, a potential amendment to the law that looks a little like that. It's the, it's sort of, I, I'm almost going to say classical law, clinical divide that is going to continue partly by the way in which we've introduced this into our Canadian context. So. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your, your wisdom and thoughts with us today and, and, your, and your time. So thank you. I'm a terrible flight attendant. I didn't even check my own equipment before starting this flight off with uh, what's very obvious here. So thank you for your patience. Um, I would uh, now like to introduce uh, Dr. Sue Hewson, who's a board member um, and former chair of the Vancouver chapter. Actually, Sue and I had an interesting conversation um, over the weekend about, um, I, said, I said something about, oh, it feels like herding cats. She said, it's not as tough as you might think. So. <laughs> I'm just saying there's hope for us all. And um, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, Alexander Muir, the current co-chair of the Vancouver chapter. Um, both are witnesses and will be able to speak to their lived experience as independent volunteer witnesses for made requests. So please uh, join us at the front. Alex is my wingman. Um, 
So I just want to take a few minutes to tell you all about the early days of witnessing made requests in Vancouver. There are definitely some heroes in this story. Um, if they're here, I would encourage them to raise their hands, and uh, you're going to be named regardless. Um, first, thank you to Kelsey Goforth, a staff member at Dying With Dignity. Kelsey understood from the very first day that I called her and said, what do I do? The fundamental importance of being part of the witness process um, for Dying With Dignity Canada. Secondly, Alex Muir, who has been our witness coordinator for over two years now and is co-chair of the Vancouver uh, chapter of Dying With Dignity Canada. Chapter strength absolutely depends on growth and succession. And while I have stepped down from the Vancouver chapter, Alex, Susan Jobes, hand up over there. There we go. Um, Sonia Burgess, Connie Jorsvik, Daryl Mahoney, and many, many others continue to expand uh, DWDC's work in community locally. And I'm so grateful. Everyone in this room will remember the outcome of the Carter case. On February 6, 2015, the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously ruled that a section of the Criminal Code of Canada preventing assisting an individual in their death must be amended. But that's not all that they had to say. Their long and thoughtful ruling gave our country the possibility to become the most liberal, human rights-based assisted dying program in the world. Alas, legislation. One of the necessities in the legislation that has come to us through C14, um, the number of restrictions, the one that we deal with the most, of course, why we're here, one being the necessity of two neutral witnesses to sign and witness the signing of a request for medical assistance in dying. So this was a problem. How did Dying with Dignity Canada become involved with witnessing? It was a natural evolution across the country. In the early days of legislation, physicians, nurse practitioners, other health care providers, individuals, and advocates for end-of-life choice were left to figure out how to navigate access to information and administration of MAID. In Vancouver, it started with a request for help from Dr. Ellen Weeb. And so fellow Dying With Dignity member and now a director, Fancy Poitra and I, went to help a lovely dying man with his maid request. When we arrived, the hospice workers were suspicious and unhelpful. Were Fancy and I more delicate flowers, we may never have gotten past their desk. However, we persisted and soon met Mr. P. To our horror and embarrassment, we were unable to serve Mr. P because he was unable physically to sign his document. I went to work distraught, and my work colleague Jen, as she does daily, stepped in to be our hero and his proxy. We all returned the same day, much to Mr. P's relief. Papers were completed, and he was able to continue with his request. Growing pains and learning curves, there were plenty of them. In that time, so very many of the people we served either did not have friends or family who qualified as witnesses, or they had friends who disagreed with their end of life choice, or they simply wanted to retain their privacy, their dignity, and their autonomy. At times, we needed to figure out the best time to do the paperwork around an individual's medication schedules, their visitors, obstructions to made as part of the culture of the institution that they were receiving care in, and the precarious living situations of some of the very disadvantaged people we served on the downtown east side of Vancouver. Witnessing is really to verify a person's information and request for made, a notary, if you will. But in the Vancouver chapter, it's always been a little bit more. While we are careful not to discuss medical, legal, or professional information, we often linger with the people we witness for if they spark a conversation, and spark conversations they do. We are sometimes the first person that they have spoken to who is not afraid to use the word death. If I had time, I would tell you something about each and every extraordinary Canadian 
You're supposed to say something now to help me. Okay. Just, or hit me. <laughs> I've had the, pri <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I've had the privilege to serve. You're not much of a wingman. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to share one more experience before I hand you over to Alex. We have found that the people we witness for are instrumental in shifting the language and culture of end of life choice in their communities and in the institutions where they request made. Margaret McPhee, Anna Kana Schofield, and I were witnesses and proxy for an eloquent and beautiful elderly woman in one of the hospice wings of Mount St. Joseph's. We were also attended by her son, a translator. She wanted clarity by using her first language, her social worker, and one of her physicians. Despite her frailty, this woman spoke thoughtfully and forcefully of a life well-lived, a son well-loved, gratitude to her team for their care, and the importance of her choice to have an assisted death. The only dry eyes in the room were hers. <laughs> I think of her often because she changed the culture of maid in that hospice in an instant. Her social worker disclosed to me later that in principle she had been opposed to maid, but her duty to her patients required a more open mind. I also think of that day because it was the last time I witnessed with Margaret McPhee. Despite dealing with her own serious health issues, Margaret always showed up when needed. She was a staunch supporter and member of Dying with Dignity Canada for decades. She showed up for meetings, she hosted meetings, she attended rallies, she was unfailingly witty and kind, especially to the people she witnessed for. And Margaret died in July of 2018, and she's powerfully missed. Okay, <laughs> now you hit me. Over to Alex. <laughs> if I can get this thing off of me. Help me out, Jeff. <laughs> there we go, I got it. I know. <laughs> you have too That's little. not my problem. <laughs> Good afternoon. To begin, I would like to thank Sue Hewson for not only starting the Vancouver chapter in 2013, but for being its guiding light. Advocate, advocating for years for the expansion of end-of-life rights for Canadians. So thank you, Sue. <clears throat> I started as a volunteer witness in April 2017, shortly after meeting Sue. In October of that year, I became the witness coordinator, and at that time we had about uh, 25 volunteers. Now, with the help of Sonia Burgess in the Fraser Valley, we handle witness requests in the southwestern corner of the BC mainland, um, pulling from a pool of, six, of 60 volunteers. Uh, um, we're not the only ones doing this in the province. The Victoria chapter is very busy handling witness requests on Vancouver Island. Um, the, the Kelowna chapter, hi Carol, uh, handles witness requests in the Okanagan, and there are a few other volunteers in the province who are, who are administered by Kelsey in, uh, in Toronto. In 2018, Vancouver chapter volunteers witnessed 137 requests for aid out of the 600 plus that were done by Dying with Dignity, Dying with Dignity volunteers across Canada. Year to date, we've completed 91 requests, so we're well ahead of last year's pace. What has changed is where these are occurring. In 2018, 55% of witness requests were done in hospitals and hospices, and that's down to 40% this year. Now, part of that may be due to what Jennifer was talking about, which is this shift as, as, you know, as more people want to, to um, have made done at home, you would expect the number, of, the percentage of witness requests to increase as well. So that might be part of it, but I think what, what's also at play here is that the the health authorities in the area are also allowing staff who aren't involved directly in the patient's care to act as witnesses. And, and we view this as a good thing because this is, this is actually expediting access to MAID for individuals. So where are the other 60% of MAID requests happening? Well, these include visits to, to houses, apartments, social housing, assisted living, long-term care facilities, and, we, and even a federal prison this year. Because some applicants want to protect their privacy, 
Our volunteers have also witnessed in coffee shops, a food court, a library, a SkyTrain station, and even on park benches. Through the Health Authority's connection to social services, we've been asked to witness several times in Vancouver's downtown east side, which uh, Sue alluded to, which is an area that's been described in the media as the poorest neighborhood in North America. And one of these made applicants was homeless. I have acted as a witness at a couple of social housing complexes in the downtown east side, and it's a pretty humbling experience. One was for a First Nations man who had several siblings in his tiny room providing him with support. Though his breathing was very difficult, he was adamant that he wanted made to proceed as soon as possible. But at the same time, he wanted to talk about and show us these lovely wood carvings that he'd done that, that decorated his room. Here was a man who had a clear vision of his identity and his destiny. On another occasion, we entered the room where the applicant, who was an ex-chef, um, pointed right away to his, uh, his proud possession, which was his pressure cooker in the corner. And what he was doing when we got there was he was, he was making uh, 15 Christmas cakes, which he was planning to hand out to family and friends prior to opting for maid. It's experiences and images from these interactions which really stick with you. And it reminds you, or it reminded me anyway, that everyone in society has a story and everyone deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. On separate occasions, I've asked the MAID coordinators of the local uh, health authorities why they believe most people um, submit a MAID request form. And they gave me the same answer. Control over your future. And as witnesses, we've seen this. The, the applicants and their families are so thankful that we have gone to them. And after we finish signing the paperwork, several, many times, they mention that they feel as if this big weight has been lifted from their shoulders. If and when they qualify for MAID after the medical assessments are completed, they may never exercise their right to a medically assisted death, but knowing that the option is available to them gives them peace of mind. Over the past couple of years, we've seen a slow increase in our reach into uh, the various cultural communities, especially the Chinese community, where, communicate, where communicating in English uh, is expected to be a challenge. We use translators provided by the BC Provincial Language, Language Service, which is through the Provincial Health Ser Services Authority. And we required their services at 10 uh, witness requests in 2018 and six so far in 2019. And these languages have included uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, Hindi, Punjabi, Italian, and Kuchi, which I discovered is a, it's an Afghan language. Um, given the demographics of the Lower Mainland, further education about MAID into all cultural groups is an opportunity which the health authorities are looking at, and we need to support this as an organization to expand uni universal access to MAID. So where does the WITNESS program go from here? Um, Canada is the only jurisdiction with, legal, with legalized uh, medical assisted death which requires independent witnesses. Now the rationale from legislators is that it, it's to prevent people from being coerced into MAID, but we believe there are enough safeguards in place at the assessor and provider level um, that this isn't necessary. And also evidence from other jurisdictions which don't require witnesses um, has have indicated that, that there, there's, there's no, uh, no coercion has taken place, so we don't really need it. So we, we, we really think the, the, the witness program should end or they should end the requirement for witnesses. So in the long run, if we get our way, that will end our program. Um, but I don't see that happening anytime soon, quite honestly. Um, we see our role continuing, especially in non-institutional settings where no staff can step in to, uh, to fill that role. In British Columbia, we work closely with the health authorities who have knowledgeable and very helpful MAID teams, and these, and these teams are growing. Um, and they actually lead people through the entire MAID process. And it's our close working relationship with Vancouver Coastal Health, Fraser Health, and Providence Health, which has fostered the growth and the breadth of our witness program. 
It's something that I expect and hope will continue while the legal requirement for independent witnesses remains in place. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank uh, the Dying with Dignity staff, especially Kelsey Goforth, who, who oversees the witness program, for their support and guidance, as well as all of our witness volunteers for their commitments to our to their the commitment to our cause and for the valuable service they provide to sick individuals trying to access their legal right to a medically assisted death. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, sharing those stories. Um, I live in Toronto and there's a, a beautiful park named Alexander Muir Gardens. And it's a beautiful park and one of my favorite places to go. It's got beautiful flowers and plants and trees and it's a place that I go um, to find peace and get my thoughts in order. So I think that's a great metaphor for the witnessing program and what you offer for the presence that for the people that you serve. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. That's that's so very powerful. Um, I'd like to next introduce our our fearless leader. Another we've got a lot of fearless people involved with this organization, that's for sure. Um, but uh, Shanaz Gokul is going to um, share a, a, a message from, from the office as our president and CEO of Dying with Dignity Canada. Welcome Shanaz. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out on a beautiful sunny afternoon here in Vancouver. For those of you that are tuning in uh, to the live stream, uh, welcome and, and hello. Uh, and thank you so much to our keynote speaker, Professor Jennifer Gibson, for sharing her thoughts and her insights and the work that she has done and continues to do on assisted dying uh, for Canadians. Uh, and a special thank you to Alex and Sue uh, for sharing their lived experience um, as independent uh, volunteer witnesses for uh, medical assistance and dying requests. Without you and without all of the volunteers across the country who do this work, for some people, a made request would not go ahead. You're needed, you're valued, and we just thank you. Uh, so I'm going to speak today a little bit about what we've been up to over the past year. Uh, and it's been a remarkable year for our organization. Uh, and we're still a pretty small uh, crew at the uh, Toronto offices. Uh, and we'll get a chance to meet them all a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, but like many uh, human rights uh, organizations, we stand on the shoulders of courage in so many, with so many people, um, with our regional chapters, 15 across the country, with our clinicians and our disability advisory councils, with our legal advisory committee, with our patrons council, uh, and of course with our um, uh, Dying with Dignity Canada board who lead this organization, set the strategy and the vision and the policy uh, so that all Canadians will be able to choose their good death. And just recently, we've started, this is a 2019 initiative, but I put it in there, a first person's witness council, so that in the future, we will make sure that people who've gone through and have had lived experiences with their loved ones will be front and center when it comes to whether it's legal advocacy or political advocacy, because those voices, they need to be heard. Uh, and so uh, those of you who've seen our, our 2018 annual report will see that our work is founded, founded on four main uh, areas. These are the four areas that we identified in 2016 when it became really clear that our work wasn't done uh, and that this organization was going to have to continue on to ensure that all Canadians could have access. Um, and it's really founded on four areas around, the first being eligibility, um, who's eligible and who's not for an assisted death. Um, access issues uh, related to um, provincial territorial standards, uh, and then our support and education work, which has really been the mainstay of our organization uh, for, for many, many years. So I'm gonna go through uh, each of the pillars and just speak very briefly about some of the highlights. 
Uh, many of you will know, and Jennifer certainly referenced uh, earlier today, the court challenges that are ongoing with regards to eligibility. Uh, the BCCLA case, which is uh, the lady on the, the far right there, Julia Lamb, uh, who's challenging the uh, eligibility criteria in Bill C-14 that a natural death, your natural death um, has become reasonably foreseeable and that you must be in an advanced state of irreversible decline of capability. And then uh, across the country, we've got the Quebec challenge with Nicole Gladou and Jean Truchon, who are challenging also the reasonably foreseeable uh, criteria and the Quebec uh, legislation, Bill 52, uh, which has a terminal provision in order to access assisted dying. We've, uh, we're involved in both of these cases. Uh, the um, Quebec challenge was heard in January. We're anticipating a court decision could come as early as next month. And the uh, BC challenge will be at trial in November this year. And then, of course, when we're talking about eligibility criteria, and Jennifer referenced this in her comments when she talked about Mo, uh, one of the vignette examples. Um, and those, uh, as I recall, Jennifer, the CCA drafts were completed by the end of August, I believe, in 2018. And it was in September that Audrey Parker, a woman from Halifax, who had a terminal diagnosis for breast cancer that had now spread throughout her body and in her brain, started speaking publicly about her need to have an assisted death on November 1st, months earlier than she wanted to, because she was one of those people who was at high risk of losing capacity because of the, the cancer that had spread to her brain. Uh, Audrey Parker was a one-woman media storm. Uh, I was in South Africa when her story started coming out in the press. And I kept thinking, I really need to chat with that lady. Um, it was remarkable because we did know in Health Canada's reporting, and we absolutely knew in 2016 that there were going to be people like Audrey who were going to be assessed who were going to be approved for assisted dying, found eligible, um, and who might be at high risk of losing capacity. Um, and with Jennifer's example this morning of Mo, you know, someone who might have a stroke um, or just slip into incapacity or a coma days before receiving an assisted death. Audrey Parker taught us something, though, in our first conversation when she kept referring uh, to herself and people like her that we knew were either choosing to die too early in order to be able to access an assisted death or who were losing the right altogether, that these people were eligible and they were in their own category. And uh, she helped us to understand that it's a subset of advanced requests, people who are assessed and approved and are now eligible. Well, nobody was happier than Audrey Parker to know that when she was talking about her own category and that first conversation with her, that she really did have her own category and helped us um, uh, and, and the country to really understand that there was a group of people that um, had a distinct uh, sort of set of circumstances uh, and there was a real unfairness. Um, and as Jennifer described earlier, people in her situation in that scenario one uh, were qu are quite clear that they want to have an assisted death. All the sort of the T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted. And so what we now know um, is that there is a possibility that we can campaign uh, for what we're calling Audrey's Amendment to Bill C-14 to ensure that other people don't have to make the difficult choice of dying too early for fear of losing capacity. I'm hard pressed and I really hope uh, I don't see the day when a judge, when a case like this, and I agree with Jennifer that many of these cases for outstanding criteria may have to go to court, will tell someone like Audrey Parker that the way that we protect you, the most vulnerable person who wants to have an assisted death, is you have to die too early. Surely, that is a tragic irony that the law did not intend. Uh, so expect to see and hear more on this particular category and the developments that we're going to be pushing ahead uh, in, the days, in the days to come. Uh, and then, of course, we know the um, reports that came out, uh, uh, Jennifer's uh, work on advanced requests, but also the other reports on mature minors and mental illness as a sole underlying criteria. Definitely more to see in the coming, I would say, months and years how other these other groups will be included. Dying with Dignity Canada has a special interest in advanced requests as a whole. Uh, and we launched a campaign in the fall of uh, 2018 uh, asking Canadians to write into their politicians 
surgeons to let them know that if someone has a de degenerative condition like dementia, that they should be able to access the same health care as other Canadians that may not have that diagnosis. So these, for, these categories for us are really about ensuring that Canadians aren't arbitrarily discriminated based on age, uh, the precariousness of their medical condition, or their medical diagnosis. More to come on that in the time ahead. And then, of course, when we're talking about the access issues, which are largely territorial and provincially based, um, in uh, last year there was a court uh, case um, on um, a court decision. The College of Physi Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario have a policy for medical assistance in dying and a human rights policy um, that requires an effective referral for clinicians who have a moral and conscious objection, recognizing that rights are not absolute and it's a fair balancing that the most vulnerable people should at least be able to have access to the help that they need and that clinicians should not abandon their patients in the time of their greatest need. We got a great victory in that case uh, at the trial level in January of 2018. The decision was appealed by the Christian Medical Dental Society of Canada, who brought the challenge forward. We were interveners at both the trial and then in January of this year at the intervention. And of course, some of you will know that last week, the uh, three uh, ju judges on the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, dismissed the appeal from the Christian Medical Dental Society of Canada and upheld the college's policy for effective referral. I'll remind all of you though, it's one court decision in one province and we can expect um, uh, that there might, this decision may be appealed, the Supreme Court may or may not grant leave to hear an appeal, uh, but we will be working actively, whether it's in the courts or across the country, to ensure that there are standards where people aren't abandoned at the greatest time of their needs. So also, more to come on that. And then, of course, we know the, c the cases around forced transfers uh, for medical assistance in dying. Forced transfers was a term that was actually coined by Dying with Dignity Canada in January of 2018, when that's sort of the bottom story there, uh, Lola um, Hyman and her son, Jackson Hyman, told the Globe and Mail the story of what happened with her um, father, who is in a uh, religiously based uh, retirement home, wanted to have an assisted death was unable, um, because of his health condition, to leave the home, and uh, a clinician went in and provided an assisted death um, to her father, Barry Hyman. Uh, but we've seen this situation and these stories all across the country. The three stories on the top all come out of Alberta, and it was by a CBC Investigates reporter, Jenny Russell, who covered these stories um, and brought a lot of attention to this issue. And this is a, this is a situation that affects every province and territory, hospitals, uh, hospices, and long-term care homes are refusing uh, to allow assisted dying on their premises. But Jenny Russell's stories in Alberta have certainly put a lot of pressure where we now see that when there was resistance to allowing even the made requests to be witnessed um, and the assessments uh, to, be, to happen on site, that a number of these facilities who had prohibited these activities are now bending and allowing, in some cases, the requests and the assessments to happen on site. Progress can sometimes feel slow, but it is in the works, and we may once again see another court challenge to move this forward to ensure that people can access their human right to an assisted death. And then, of course, there's our personal support program. You've all heard lovely shout-outs to Kelsey Goforth, uh, who's really um, spearheaded the uh, volunteer witness initiative across the country. Um, and then we have Nino Sekipet, um, who's been providing bereavement um, and emotional counseling for about seven years um, with our organization. And last year, we had uh, over 1,000 new uh, people contact the organization by phone or email seeking support. This program is such a cornerstone for the work that we do. It is the work that grounds us in lived experience. And as a human rights organization, this work, the, the w independent witnessing program, hearing people and trying to support them, it gives us the credibility to know that when we're standing up here or we're testifying in front of various committees or speaking to the media, that our truth is your truth, that we bring those experiences to the forefront 
as they should be for human rights issues like ours. And then, of course, you've heard about the witnessing. And I'm going to say, because I think the, the latest numbers um, for the total number of May deaths for, since 2016 is probably about 8,000 people, between seven and 8,000 people. If that was the number of witnesses, um, witnessing requests for uh, 2017, we had witnessing for 2016, and then where we are for 2018, I think I might be lowballing it when I say that our volunteer witnesses are witnessing in 10 to 15 percent of all made requests across the country. So it's a significant number of people that we're reaching out to and trying to support. And I agree with Alex. Don't think this program's going anywhere anytime soon. And so our organization is really committed to strengthening the program and making sure sure that we provide that support and the resilience for the volunteers that do this work and in doing so enter into spaces where there is vicarious trauma that they are absorbing, absorbing. and we want to make sure that we support people but we also support our incredible volunteers. And in um, uh, our, our work we have since 2016, had the privilege uh, of working with clinicians across the country. Uh, quite by accident, um, when in 2016, we asked Ellen Weeb to do a webinar for some of the clinicians on our advisory council, some of whom were interested in providing uh, and assessing for uh, medical assistance in dying. Uh, we did not know that that request would turn into a monthly case-sharing webinar uh, with clinicians, doctors, and nurse practitioners all across the country who come together uh, and share uh, details of cases anonymously with their peers uh, to learn, to support, to ask difficult questions. Um, and it's something that we do in uh, conjunction with the Canadian Association of Made Assessors and Providers who are very uh, happy and proud to partner with because once again, that lived experience of the clinicians helps inform our advocacy work and grounds it. And you can sort of see what I'm saying here from a very 360 perspective, we have a view of what's going on with assisted dying because of the work that we do that I think, quite frankly, no one else in the country does. Let's talk about our education a little bit. And we once again look to our chapters across the country who deliver uh, in community advanced care planning workshops, talk about patient rights, and of course they talk about medical assistance in dying. And many of them speak at other events where they are requested to come in to bring the expert perspective that we have with our volunteer educators um, into places that we might not have been invited before 2016, but certainly are sought after now um, in this new era where there is a greater focus on not just assisted dying, but because of assisted dying, end of life care in general. We started in 2017 uh, a, uh, an online education series, End in Mind, uh, and Jennifer spoke uh, recently at a panel in, um, I think it was February 6th, around February 4th, sort of in timing with the anniversary of the Carter decision. Uh, and you can see the numbers for last year. We get a lot of people that, that show up. But that February 2019 uh, webinar, we had over 1,100 people sign up for it. About 600 people tune in in the middle of a Monday afternoon uh, to sort of dig into these issues, uh, and especially the issue around advance requests. So our capacity to reach people, to help you know, educate, and I think of education uh, as the ultimate tool for empowerment, to help all Canadians, once again, going back to the vision of Dying with Dignity Canada, to achieve their good death. Uh, we're in the news an awful lot. There were quite a number of stories uh, last year. Many of you may recall the story of Shirley and George Brickenden, um, a couple who had been married for 73 years that we supported through their end of life uh, journey and their request for medical assistance in dying, who died together in Toronto the end of uh, last March. Uh, and stories around, as I mentioned before, forced transfers, uh, Lawrence Hill, notable uh, and incredible Canadian author, whose own mother, Donna May Hill, contacted our organization when she was um, denied eligibility in Toronto and traveled uh, to Switzerland to access an assisted death. 
and Audrey Parker fueled such a media storm. Uh, it was incredible. And we believe uh, for 2018, our earned media as a small little organization is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the coverage we've seen in national um, uh, news publications, but also in national headlines. So there's a lot of impact uh, happening, but uh, relying on so many people who, who share the one and the single most important thing that's gonna drive these issues moving forward. I told some folks last night, and I just ha can't resist it, I have to tell it again today, that uh, last uh, Sunday, a uh, very famous uh, character, Tyrion Lannister from the Game of Thrones, said the single most important thing that will impact change is the power of a good personal story. And that is so true, and that is the sweet spot of our organization, but it's also how we do what we're supposed to do as a human rights organization, to bring the voices and the stories of people, some who've died with a good death, some with assisted dying, some without, and some who've had a number of problems and stories along the way. Uh, Leanna Britton has told her story so gracefully and eloquently of Paul, who was the first person in Prince Edward Island to access an assisted death, but also was someone that was very worried about losing capacity and died a little earlier than he wanted to. And then we have the story of Jean and Don Eyre sharing their experience with Jean's progress towards an assisted death. And Don Kent, when he received a catastrophic diagnosis last January, emailed us and said, can I share my story? Will that help? Became the first diarized story in Canada of someone on a, it wasn't quite a week by week, but multiple stories over a period of time until he accessed it, uh, assisted death, I think around March or April last year. But what an inside perspective that gave all of us and all of you the read, that read that story of the considerations and the decisions and the feelings and the emotions uh, that go through um, you know, a person's mind and their family's mind when they're trying to access an assisted death. And I'm also gonna give a shout out to Yana Bullman, who's in the audience today, who has told her story about her husband's uh, assisted death with such courage and such passion. Um, and I thank you and I thank everyone, all of these people and all of you who share your stories and who fuel our advocacy work and you will fuel change in the future. I'm going to talk a little bit about a few other things that are sort of notable. One is our uh, online impact um, in the digital space. I'm just going to point out one particular number because I think it's really helpful when it looks at how much we've grown our organization. In, the, in December of 2015, we had about 6,000 people on our emailable list, people we could email um, you know, uh, and ask them to mobilize uh, for, for various uh, actions and, and writing letters and such. Uh, well, we've discovered that there's a real appetite for that, and our list between 2017 and 2018 grew by 94%, and right now, we're at about 45,000 people actively engaged and interested in supporting this organization. It's a real testimony, I think, or a testament to the power of the Carter decision in creating safe spaces for people to have really important conversations about themselves, their family, their friends, and their end of life. Let's go back here to, I skipped that, some major milestones. Uh, our uh, chair, Senator Jim Cowan, uh, mentioned a, a really uh, important one earlier uh, the last year um, when Dave Jackson, a Vancouver businessman, who I spent uh, four hours on a rainy uh, afternoon in Vancouver in June of 2017 talking about our work, um, left us six weeks later, he died. He didn't know he was ill, I didn't know he was ill, um, but left Dying with Dignity Canada a multi-million dollar bequest. We received the first installment of June of 2018. The rest is coming this year. Once again, a testament to someone's belief not just in the work that we're doing now, but that we must be here in the future so that Canadians can come and rely, to, rely on us. Many of you saw our live stream and heard our news about receiving charitable status in November of 2018. Love that story because a lot of lawyers told me it wasn't gonna be possible. But you know what? When you work in human rights and you are a human rights organization, 
And by the way, there's a special category at the Canada Revenue Agency for human rights advocacy that is absolutely allowable. You get to change not just the CRA's mind, you get to change the country, which is, is exactly what having charitable status is gonna allow us to do when we're able to provide receipts to our donors. It's gonna help us fuel the change that all the stories are telling us that we need to work on. And then in November of uh, 2018, uh, just another shout out to uh, our fund development officer, Laura Satin uh, Levin, who you'll meet in just a moment when I drag her up here with some of the other staff, uh, has grown our monthly donor program. In 2015, at the end of 2015, there was about um, 75 monthly donors that brought in about um, I think about fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars $60,000. We're now in a situation where we have almost 1,500 monthly donors uh, that are bringing in about a quarter of a million dollars for this year, probably hitting 300000 by the end of uh, 2019. So just incredible work and amazing to be recognized um, at the Association of Fundraising Professionals Congress uh, in uh, um, November last year in front of a thousand people who when we were called up, when I was called up, that's Kate Mahoney who uh, works with us and was our sponsor for this award from uh, Public Outreach. Um, when we were called up, I was wondering because every other award recipient, when they were called up onto the stage, a thousand people stood and gave a standing ovation. I have to confess, I had my doubts, but how thrilling to see a thousand people rise up and applaud for Dying with Dignity Canada. We've come far, my friends. And then a uh, special uh, acknowledgement. This um, was uh, uh, taken from a slide that was projected at the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers Conference last year in uh, Ottawa. And uh, I walked into that room. Some of you may have heard this story. I saw this slide on the uh, on, that, uh, on, on either side of the stage, and the first person I ended up sitting next to was Professor Jocelyn Downey, and I looked up and I said, see that? That was 38 years in the making to see our logo with the Canadian Medical Association and Health Canada. We continue to come far. And then this past year, you know, partnering with other organizations, working with the, the lawyers at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario in support of their policy on effective referral, being part of a coalition, a coalition with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, the HIV um, AIDS um, uh, Action uh, Organization, who worked with us on the effective referral. There's so many wonderful partnerships that are coming out of the time and the movement that we're in. Um, so for anyone watching that's in another organization and you wanna work with us, we wanna work with you if you care about human rights for people at end of life. What to do, where are we gonna go? So much to do, I'll keep this super, super brief. You know, when we found out we were getting charitable status and we knew that um, we had this multi-million dollar bequest, we knew the work wasn't done, um, and we knew that we had you know, the support of so many people across the, the country and standing on the legacy of so many people who had come before us. Sue Rodriguez, sorry. That's what happens when you speak too, too, too long. <coughs> Apologies. Sue Rodriguez, Kay Carter. We saw Lee Carter and her husband Hollis last night an event, at an event really connecting the past to the future. But I remember thinking to myself, you know, for some organizations, sometimes you have the question of where's the ceiling? And what I like to say is with all of the opportunities and the challenges that have come forward, when I look up, I see blue sky for this organization. So lots more to come in the time ahead. And lastly, I'm gonna call you guys all up here. Uh, Cameron Duncan, Corey Roof, Laura Satin Levin, and Allison Jeffrey, please come to the front with me. Um, not all of our staff are here in Vancouver, but it is a tradition of mine um, and so important for all of you uh, to sort of see and know who the people are that really drive the work that we do. <laughs> I'm 
just going to go through um, a, a very brief list. I'll actually to put that slide right back up and for you guys to slide maybe over this way so I don't miss anybody. Um, so of course, this is Allison to the immediate right. Uh, she's our, one of our fundraisers. Cameron uh, is our new chief uh, operations officer. Laura Satin Levin, our fund development officer. Corey Roof, our communications officer. And in Toronto, we have Deborah Aguillon, who's our office coordinator. Anya Colangelo, just to the right, working our way down, who's our database administrator extraordinaire. Um, Kelsey Goforth, who I don't think needs any more introduction because you've all heard so much about Kelsey Goforth, and Nino Sakapet, our psychotherapist on staff. And then over on this side to the left, Maureen Aslin, our education and engagements officer that supports the work, the vital work um, of our chapters in our education program. Alexandra Tomiko Dadult, who's our new communications officer. We've got Rachel Fan. For those of you that have ever shared a story on our blog, you've talked to Rachel Fan. And our newest addition, one of our newest additions to our team, Peter Tan, who's supporting our database work. Because one of the things that happens when you grow your organization is there's more work for people to do in your offices. And I say to all of the staff here with us today and the staff that I think some of you are watching at home right now, these are the people who are the wind of the sails of this organization and who drive the work forward and who, without which, I wouldn't be able to stand here today so proudly and be able to share all of the accomplishments that we have managed as an organization. So I thank each of you and those of you back in Toronto. Thank you all. That was great. Thank you, Shanaz. It's a real, uh, it's it's a little bit mind blowing and overwhelming to see all that uh, this organization has accomplished under your amazing leadership and with the incredible staff. I have the privilege of uh, getting to work with the staff um, in the downtown Toronto area, and uh, every time I you know walk in there, the the buzz and the excitement and the passion for the work um, is just uh, absolutely unbelievable. So we're so grateful and appreciative of of all that you do to to keep this movement going. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to well reintroduce Cameron Duncan, who's the um, wonderful uh, Chief Operating Officer of Dying with Dignity. He's, you know, as a, as a person with German heritage who's usually on top of all of her things, I've never met anybody more on top of their things than uh, Cameron. So he's going to come and uh, award the Volunteer Program of the Year. Good afternoon. Each year at our AGM, we like to take the time to highlight one of our volunteer programs. Volunteers across the country in many different roles are those who allow the organization to have the profound impact that it does. I'm glad to be able to share today about DWDC's volunteer chapters. Being new to my position here at DWDC, a special thanks to the chapter heads and volunteers who helped me put this together. Our chapters work across the country, from west to east, Victoria, Vancouver, Kelowna, Edmonton, Calgary, Lethbridge, Winnipeg, Niagara, Hamilton, Halton, Ottawa, Halifax. And we're very excited to have started on the onboarding process for our newest chapter in PEI. Our chapters, led by dedicated co-chairs, engage in a wide range of projects. Let me share some of their involvements broken down into the four strategic pillars Shanaz just spoke of. In terms of advocacy for eligibility and access to MAID, I'm going to share a story that encapsulates the advocacy work that the chapters partake in time to time. I had a phone call with the chapter head out of Calgary, June Churchill, earlier this week. She shared with me the story of how Alberta chapters brought a grassroots response to the injustice of forced transfers that was happening in many facilities in Alberta. These hospitals were not allowing made assessments <clears throat> or facilitation of made on their, process, on their premises. Last fall, journalists in Alberta reported on these issues. June engaged with the head office to start an online Alberta petition. Alberta chapters banded together and engaged their friends and connections to bring attention to the issue. And within just three weeks, they'd garnered more than 600 signatures. 
They followed it up with letter writing meetings held in Calgary, Edmonton, and Lethbridge, producing over 120 written letters plus emails to the Premier and Health Minister. The Edmonton chapter further arranged for meetings with the Health Minister and other members of the Legislative Assembly. On December 4th, Covenant Health revised their health policies on MAID to allow for assessments and transfers for provision. This was a big adjustment. When it comes to DWDC's advocacy, our local chapters boost awareness locally, coordinate a local response, and continue to tip us off of the barriers to access facing members in their communities. Sue and Alex already described the work that chapters do around support, facilitating and acting as independent witnesses in their communities. And this is integral work. But the work of some of the chapters goes further, and they have created and facilitated different support groups in different loca uh, locations uh, for those who may have lost someone through MAID. The fourth pillar, education, is a key area of chapter work. The list of the ways that chapters engage is broad and diverse in education. While some of the bread and butter focuses on talks and community workshops on advanced care planning, our chapters are creative in finding new spaces where they can reach, inform, and empower Canadians. From film screenings and of videos and documentaries, to book clubs, to booths at health fairs supporting other groups interested in death and dying, speaking to boards and facilities such as hospices and care facilities, and speaking in universities and colleges. The outreach is really broad. What I think is amazing, and especially from my, my new position and just sort of coming in and learning about this all for the first time, is how robust and established the chapter system is when it began only back in 2012. In this year, with a vision for the tremendous potential that a chapter network could have, three pilot chapters were established in Salt Spring, Island, BC, Calgary, Alberta, and Grand River, Ontario. These groups marked the beginning of the learning, exploring, and new projects and types of work and led to the 13 chapters that we have throughout the country today. It's very important to recognize the incredible amount of work that the chapters take on. Naturally, chapters grow and fade at times based on the realities and capacities of these volunteer groups. DWDC's office has been limited in the capacity and, and supply that it's been able to support these chapters, and we are continuing to work to increase the support for this vital work. In the year ahead, we're looking to expand chapters into St. John's, Newfoundland, Owen Sound, Kingston, and London, Ontario. Within our strategic plan, we recognize that the work laid out ahead would be impossible without the dedicated support and active engagement of the individuals in our chapters. At this time, I'd like to ask for anyone here who is involved in a chapter or has been involved in a chapter to either raise your hand or stand up. Can we clap for them, please? <clears throat> we are so appreciative for all that you do. Thank you for being the pillars of progress that hold up DWDC at this moment in our history and in those to come. I'm very glad personally to be working with the chapters. For those of you who are here today who raised your hand, or, um, I'd love to speak to you and connect, so please come and find me after so you can share your story. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm never, um, it never ceases to amaze me the um, momentum and the movement um, that this organization has across the country, the, the number of, of engagement points and, and momentum that it continues to build because of all of your support. It's uh, really a, a very special and wonderful thing to witness and uh, everything that we've been, um, we've accomplished is, is what, from what has been come, has come before and uh, because of the momentum that you continue to build. So thank you so much, um, Cameron, for that. Um, I think that we're, we're running a little bit over time, but I'm sure everyone um, enjoyed the rich information that was shared here today. Um, and we thank everyone for attending and for coming and uh, sharing your presence with us and, and your important, valuable time. We thank everyone for logging in online um, to join us across the country and hope um, that you've taken away some, some wonderful information and, and to keep those conversations going. You know, it really is because of all of us, of, of what we've accomplished together, as I've said. And, you know, um, I, I likened this yesterday 
yesterday um, to you know all the the volunteers, the donors, and all of the key constituents who have who have contributed to Dying with Dignity. You've really created an amazing advanced care plan for this organization and this movement. And I think that's a really um, a wonderful thing. And, and as Shanaz um, pointed out, the 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 possibility and the vision are are limitless from with what we can accomplish from here. So um, thank you, everyone. We are so grateful for all of your support and your companionship and friendship and uh, solidarity um, as we build and continue with this movement. So we are going to take a very short break. Um, this will end the live stream portion now, um, and then we will reconvene for the uh, second portion of the AGM. So thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we'll see the rest of you soon. Thank you.